Today I want to share with you one of my family's favorite recipes, sourdough donuts. I have tried a lot of different sourdough donut recipes out there and I found that most of them are a little too dense or a little too chewy, at least for my liking. But through recipe testing, I have found that if you add in what's called tangzheng or a milk roux or sometimes what's referred to as a processed and Japanese milk bread, the donut becomes light and fluffy and just how you want a donut to be. So come along with me and I will show you how to make your very own sourdough donuts at home. to do is make the tang zheng or milk brew and that is because it needs to cool off which luckily it cools pretty quickly but we just don't want to put it into the rest of the dough hot because it could kill the starter so in a small saucepan i have mixed together 180 grams of milk and 38 grams of unbleached bread flour so i'm just going to whisk them together until they're combined and then i'm going to keep whisking this so that way the milk doesn't burn and what i'm looking for is for the texture of this mixture to resemble something like mashed potatoes if you've ever made a roux just for any regular cooking it's very similar it's just in a lot more volume so you can see here it's starting to get a little bit thicker and once it starts to thicken it actually happens pretty quickly so as soon as you notice the texture starting to change Really pay attention because before you know it, it will be ready and we really don't want this to burn. So you can see now this mixture is really thick. So what we'll do is we'll put this on a plate and smooth it over so it's nice and thin and that way it cools faster and we can get going with the rest of our dough. While we are letting this cool, we can start getting the other ingredients prepared. So I'll be using my stand mixer and a dough hook to knead this, which I do recommend if you have one. Theoretically, technically, yes, of course, you could knead this by hand, but this is an enriched dough, meaning it needs a more intense mix. And that is because enriched doughs contain added ingredients like eggs, butter, milk, that weaken the structure of the dough. So a stand mixer can help build that strength. Your hands can too, you just need to be a little ripped, and I believe that you are. So you can use your hands to knead this if that is all you have today. In the bowl of my stand mixer, I'm going to weigh out all of my ingredients. I'm going to start with 200 grams of a mature sourdough starter. Theoretically, you could use inactive starter, but I would recommend using active because it'll just speed up the bulk fermentation time. But if you are desperate to make donuts right now and all you have is inactive, that's fine. You will just have to wait a little bit longer for your dough to bulk ferment. And one of the things about measuring ingredients like this, I like, I like to use a scale because I like to be close to precise, but it's okay if it is not exact. So I just weighed out 204 grams of starter. It's going to be okay. So if you're looking for absolute precise measurements, I don't know if this is the right place for you, but if you're looking to close to precise and a good time, this is definitely the place for you. I'm also going to add in three eggs. So I need to wash these because these are farm fresh eggs. So we'll wash the eggs and then we'll put them right in the bowl. Sometimes you'll see egg measurements in recipes. I don't really look at the weight of eggs. I just look at how many they say because every egg is different and how are you really gonna measure that? I'm also going to add in 38 grams of sugar. And the thing that's nice about using a bowl like this to weigh is you don't have to worry about using a scoop or anything. You just dump it in there. So then we're gonna add in bread flour. So bread flour has a higher protein content than all-purpose flour. And in my experience, it makes all the difference in the quality of your sourdough donut. So if possible, I do recommend using bread flour for this recipe. And then we are also adding in a teaspoon of vanilla and then we'll add in 12 grams of salt oh, on the dot then we're also going to add in a stick of butter the butter needs to be softened but not melted if it's melted it will turn your dough into like a greasy mess so if you're better at this than I am, you'll remember to take your butter out of the fridge and let it sit out overnight. But if not, just pop it in the microwave for a few seconds until it is softened. I'm actually gonna cube that butter up in the bowl. Honestly, it's a little bit easier for the mixer to work that way, and I kind of forgot. So if you forget, don't worry, just take your knife, cube it upright in the bowl. And then last but not least, finally we get to add our milk roux or tang zheng. If you really want to get all of it there, I recommend using a silicone spatula. That's probably a better idea than what I'm doing. You can watch this and see all the things that you would do differently and better and then do them. <laughs> so now we just mix everything together in the stand mixer. 
and we're almost done. So this will have to be in the stand mixer for about 10 to 15 minutes or until it passes the window pane test. If you're not sure what the window pane test is, I have a video tutorial of that that I'll link in the description box below, but essentially it is just a way to tell if your dough has been kneaded enough. And I just got this started, so we have a little ways to go. is check the dough to see if it's been kneaded enough. So it's probably been about 10 minutes or so, and it is getting pretty light and fluffy here, you can see, but it's not really like smooth and elastic and stretchy, so it breaks really easily. So that means we need to knead this a little bit longer. So that's what I was talking about when kneading by hand. I mean, this has been probably close to 10 minutes in the mixer, and it still has a little ways to go. Uh, this is also a little bit sticky, but honestly, it is okay. You don't want this dough to be so sticky that it's like all over your hands but it is okay for it to be a little bit sticky because of the milk root, it's a higher hydration dough. That's what makes it lighter and softer. So it's okay if it's sticky, you just don't want it to be like soupy and like stuck all over your hands. It is getting a lot lighter and a lot fluffier even just after a few minutes. It's getting close, but it's not quite as strong as I want it. Yes, he's the tour right there. So I want it to need to need just a little bit longer, but we are definitely getting close. This dough looks really good to me. It's light, it's fluffy. You can see it's kind of hard to tell on camera, but it's smooth and elastic. And then you can tell if it's been kneaded enough because you can see light pass through the dough when I stretch it thin. It's a little hard to see from this angle, but from my perspective, I can see light passing through. So this dough looks really good to me and is ready. So the next step is to just let it bulk ferment. Okay, so the next thing that we do is grease a bowl and we let it bulk ferment. I like to use oil in a bowl because it helps prevent any drying out that could occur because this dough is going to be sitting around to bulk ferment for eight to 12 hours, and then it's going to cold proof for another eight or 10 hours. So it will have a lot of rest time where I just don't want it to dry out. So I just take a little bit of olive oil in a bowl, rub it around, then just take your dough and place it right into the bowl. I like to just roll it around in there so all sides of the dough are covered. Moisturize your hands. <laughs> and then place the lid on it and you let this sit on the counter for eight to 12 hours. It is the end of the day and this dough has been sitting on the counter for about 10 hours and it is time to get it in the fridge for cold proofing. I know it's ready for cold proofing because it has doubled in size and it's starting to dome on top. This is a little hard to capture on camera, but you can definitely tell that it is larger than it was when I put it in the bowl and on the countertop this morning. And the top of the dough is starting to dome. So these are two good, reliable indicators that your dough has bulk fermented long enough. So this will go in the fridge overnight for cold proofing, which develops flavor. So when you put your dough in the fridge, the metabolic process of the yeast and bacteria slows down, but the dough starts to develop that coveted sourdough flavor that we want from the finished product. So I'm gonna put the lid back on and let this rest in the fridge overnight. Good morning, the dough has been cold proofing overnight and we are ready to roll, cut, and do a second rise for these donuts. I have a baking sheet lined with parchment paper and what I'm going to do is just sprinkle this with a little bit of flour. And what this does is it's just a place to rest the donuts for their second rise. So that way, when it's time to fry them, it's just a little bit easier to move them into the hot oil. So all we're gonna do is simply just turn the dough out onto the counter and roll it to about a half inch thick. It's okay if it's a little thicker, a little bit thinner, but around a half an inch is probably good. I'm gonna use these donut cutters to cut them out. So the first time I ever made donuts, I used a wine glass to cut the outer circle and then a champagne flute to cut the inner circle. It worked okay, you can definitely do that, but I do recommend, if possible, getting donut cutters because it just makes life a lot easier. I 
I cut seven large dough nuts and two small. I have a lot of extra dough, but the thing is once you need to re-roll it, it's kind of hard if it's not cold. So I put it back in the fridge to chill. You would probably not have to do that, but because I'm filming and I'm also taking pictures from my blog, it takes a little bit more time for me. So my dough got room temperature and it's really hard to roll. So once that is chilled again, I will re-roll it and I will cut more donuts. But in the meantime, we'll go ahead and continue with these. The donuts will need to be covered and rised for about two to three hours or until they're nice and puffy. And usually I see people say to use plastic wrap, but I found that plastic wrap is a little too tight and it sticks to the donuts and when they start to rise it kind of restricts them from rising so i have this giant home goods shopping bag that i cut and i use this to cover my donuts because i can kind of tent it and that gives them room to rise but also keeps it covered so that way there's no problem with them drying out You'll also have all these little donut holes. So these are viable and delicious donuts. So I rise these two and then I fry them when I'm doing the regular donuts. And then when you have extra chocolate or vanilla glaze, you can just slide it on the edge of the bowl and eat these for a snack. So don't forget to save these and do a second proof for these two. The donuts are ready to go into the oil, so I am getting my Dutch oven prepared. So I'm putting about two inches of neutral oil inside of my enameled cast iron Dutch oven. You can use whatever piece of cookware that you have that's safe for frying. Just make sure that it's deep enough that it can hold two inches of oil and that it's wide enough that you can fit a couple of donuts in there. You don't want to crowd the donuts in, but you do want enough space to be able to hold like two, three, maybe even four donuts. The temperature of your oil is going to make or break your donut. If your oil drops below 350, you are going to have a soggy donut. If it gets too high, you're going to have a burned donut. So we're really looking for somewhere in the three 360 to 365 range. So I like to use a digital thermometer and place it on the side and this can just help me make sure that I have the right temperature for my oil. And one of the tricks to frying is to make sure that you heat your oil up a little higher than what you want because when you put the food in, it actually cools the oil off. So even though I want this to be close to like 360, 365, I'm gonna let it get up to about 370 or 375 so that way it can drop and not get below 350. When it's time to put your donut in the oil, take your donut, put it on a slotted spoon and then very carefully place it into the hot oil. then just let it fry for a minute or two on one side and then use tongs to gently turn them to the other side. And then you just repeat this process until you have fried all of your donuts. I don't know if you can see the inside of this donut hole as well as I can, but if you can see it is so fluffy and light on the inside, that might be the best donut I've ever had. The other official thing you have to do is any weird ones you have, like this weird donut hole, you have to eat it. You have to make sure it's safe for everyone else to consume. These look amazing. So while these cool off, I'm going to make a vanilla glaze and a chocolate glaze for these. I will leave the recipes for the glazes in the description box below, but really you can use any glaze recipe you want or any topping for donuts that you want. So I don't wanna to spend too much of your time talking about the glazes because that's probably the easiest part of all of this. Official Moon and Magnolia taste tester is home from school and she approves especially of the chocolate ones. Piper, do you like the chocolate donuts? Yeah. <laughs> the inside of these donuts is so light and so fluffy. You and your family are going to love them and I can't wait for you guys to enjoy them together. Thank you so much for tuning into Moon and Magnolia's YouTube channel where we elevate the everyday from scratch to at home and with donuts and I'll see you again next time.